All right. All right. So um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm very glad to come back here. My second come back because uh, many of you know I graduated from here 2001 and I uh, haven't been back in the past 19 years, <laughs> very long time. So a lot of things just come back to my memory, very nice. And I see a lot of people still on Zoom. So, and I also very honored because this is the first in-person presentation. I hope this is a good sign means a life going, going to be back to normal. So without saying too much, I, let me start with my presentation today is a semi-parametric regression uh, analysis for multivariate interval sensor data. And actually this talk is uh, includes two different topics, even though they both on this multivariate interval sensor events, which I'm going to give you a little bit more detail next uh, slide or in two slides. So this is a joint work with uh, my colleague, Dan Yuli, and uh, also our former student, Fei Gao. Uh, I think she is uh, with the Fur Hatch um, at Seattle. So. Uh, which one is? Uh... Oh, is, is, it, is it working? Okay. Is it working? Thank you. So um, this is an introduction, uh, like this, this is the this, this, uh, sketch of this talk. So I can introduce problems. As I said earlier, this will be combination of two different topics. So first one is about joint model, how to combine different interval sensor type of events. So as you can see, some events can be right sensor, the other types could be interval sensor. And then we're gonna combine those data into our modeling and eventually for risk prediction. The second uh, topic is going to relate to multivariate interval sensor, but we're going to focus on panel count data. And the panel count data you can imagine is uh, um, like a kind of uh, interval sensor recurrent events. So I'll give you more detail later. All right, so, um, so first uh, one is, uh, I, I, I think it's fine, right? So these are multiple types of uh, interval sensor data. So this kind of data show up in a lot of clinical and cohort studies. And especially when you do cohort study, I think I'm doing electronic health records data, but also, also a lot of observation studies, cohort study. You, when you follow the uh, subjects, you always, always can see events related to two different groups of the, uh, event, uh, disease. One is that we call the symptomatic disease, which means when event happens, you can observe symptoms. Obviously, the most uh, common one is death, right? People die, you know, when they die. So, and then the other one is uh, asymptomatic disease. So that kind of disease, you don't observe a symptom. So usually they have to monitor patients, or I don't say patients, monitor subject on like discrete time points based on a certain biomarker and use biomarker to determine if this kind of event happened or not happened. So that's kind of in the sense of so like related to COVID-19, you can imagine symptomatic disease can be, uh, I don't say disease, maybe like a time to hospitalization, right? Time to death, that's a usual right sensitive event. And for asymptomatic disease, like a time to infection. So the people get infected by this COVID-19, you don't observe them, but once they go to do testing, the testing positive, you know this kind of infection occurred before testing date. Thank you. So um, the ex motivating example for this type of work uh, actually come from the Eric study. So Eric study is a very big cohort study and that study started from 1989. So by the time we published this paper, it's already like 27 years. And this study, uh, the, the reason we use this study because uh, study data coordinate center is within UNC, is within our department. So we use that data quite a lot. So the study purpose is try to study risk factor for cardiovascular disease events. So in this case, so you can see symptomatic disease can include MI, stroke, of course, death. And for asymptomatic disease, you can imagine it is a type of diabetes, hypertension, which kind of comorbidity or highly related to cardiovascular disease event. And for the last, this diabetes, hypertension, 
So there's no way you can observe when they're gonna occur. So usually just uh, in this study is a five different visit time points and the subject come in, you take a the blood, uh, measure blood pressure, you measure glucose level, and then you find that kind of information. There's kind of, uh, kind of theoretical to tell if this event happened or not happened. So uh, this kind of data is uh, kind of common and the people have been started in this kind of type of data for a long time. But most of the poetry people do, do separate it. You know, we have worked like a survival analysis. So people have been using a lot of model for right sensor data, including myself and my uh, colleagues as well. Uh, but also there are a group of people doing interval sensor data. And uh, uh, a few years ago, we also did uh, like a uh, um, efficient estimation for interval, interval sensor data. So the work we propose here, you try to do joint analysis. And I'm going to explain why we want to do joint analysis later. So, the main purpose of you to join us is you can account all the subject information and that's very important for risk projection. Sorry, I tried to see which one might. Uh, is there anyone I can just use mouse? Oh, is the keyboard? All right, thank you. Oh yeah, just clicking. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the second uh, the kind of related data we can I can talk about in this uh, uh, presentation is pan account data. Pan account data essentially is kind of uh, recurrent events, but you still you don't observe the event occurrence time. Instead, you only observe the count of events within intervals. So the same idea is here is, as I give an example, like a number of losses uh, feed the water polo in nuclear plant, a number of tumors in cancer patient or number of damaged joints in this uh, kind of patient. So in this case, like uh, you don't exactly observe when this uh, like a tumor occurrence or this damage happen, but instead you monitor the patient on like a scheduled visits or run the visit, at each visit, they're going to report how many events happen before this visit and uh, 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 between this visit and the previous visit. So in that case, you don't see exact time information, but you know the count, okay? So let's a panel count data. So well, I basically panel count, they can be viewed as aggregate kind of information from recurrent events. Because we know through recurrent event analysis, you know exactly time course, right? But here is aggregate data, you only observe like a count. Okay, so in this case, we're also interested in certain like risk factor, how they associate with this uh, type of outcome. So um, for pan account data, there are some existing methods like a proportion mean model people have been using. In this kind of model, people should basically try to model the mean count. So you can think about like average count across in the population and how this depends on different risk factors. And this kind of model can be treated as like a general class to generalize estimate equation in longitudinal data, basically kind of marginal model. So it's not efficient, but it's robust, right? And there are some uh, estimated, they're easy to compute, but they require kind of a very strict assumption. For example, uh, the sooner way paper, they require examination time point to be fixed number of time points for all the patients. So which uh, usually ha doesn't happen in the observation study. And uh, also Werner and Zhang, they have this uh, kind of iterative algorithm, try to calculate the non-parametric MLE for uh, pan account data, uh, but computation is not quite stable. And so that's kind of another thing I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to introduce, so we think it's kind of very efficient algorithm to compute a stable estimate. There are also spline approach, kind of sieve type of estimation approach. Um, same type of approach, you basically they try to approximate, in this case, it's a baseline function through some like a spline functions. And for same type of approach, the nice thing is they can produce a very smooth estimator, but downside is you have to choose number of basis function. You have to choose the spline knots when you use this kind of approach. So we try to avoid this kind of approach in our, uh, in our method here. And uh, well, actually we're going to not only focus on just one single pan account data, but we're going to look, look at the multiple pan account data, which means it's still pan account data, but there's multiple types. 
So example, for example, we looked at the recurrence of different types of tumor or recurrence of different cardiovascular disease uh, events. There's not much work on this multiple uh, pen account data. So we're going to uh, address this issue here too. So uh, this is a very brief outline of this talk. We're going to focus on proportion hazard model, even though myself, uh, I've been doing a lot of transformation model for saliva data. All this approach can be extended to a transformation model, but we only focus on proportion hazard model because after so many years of transformation model, we still realize that proportion hazard model is the most popular model people want to use in the survival analysis. And then we're going to join to join the modeling for this uh, multivariate pan account data or multivariate interval sensor events. And then we're going to use certain like a random effects model, try to, try to account for within subject correlation. And I think the uh, important thing is compared to uh, existing approach, we're going to do this kind of semi-parametric efficient estimate approach. So essentially we're going to base on this non-parametric maximum likelihood estimation. So I'm going to give you more detail here. So in other words, we are trying to do estimation, but we should for most efficient one, okay? And uh, I also mentioned, we're going to deal with, develop this computationally efficient algorithm because uh, in the sense it's uh, not a new topic, it's a uh, old topic and actually has a long history, almost like 30, 40 years. One big headache for interval sensor analysis is computation. Because you can imagine the computer you write the sensor data when you only have the event within interval, you don't have a lot of information, right? It's like a missing data, but very, very sparse information. And the, how you get a good estimation using very sparse data is a challenge. And if all this kind of iterated algorithm or even other algorithm in the previous work, usually couldn't give very stable estimation. So in this case, we're going to propose some algorithm we think is, uh, actually it turns out to be very stable and efficient. All right, so um, this similar models, obviously you can see I can introduce uh, some notation from here. So we assume is uh, first the K1 events that are asymptomatic events, which means this events they're going to be interval sensor. But also rest of the events, I call it K2 number events, they subject to right sensor. So if you want to use the example, you can think about K1, include like a time to diabetes, time to hypertension. K2 can be time to a stroke, time to death. You can think about this way, right? And then we include this XK as covariates, and then we want to include the time dependent covariates, but we assume to, uh, they are external. And for internal, we don't have this kind of model. Actually, I had a nice uh, discuss, uh, talk with uh, Alex this morning. And we talk about internal external covariance as well. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to introduce random effects, more, uh, effects try to account for this dependence across different events within the same subject. This is important because uh, when you do joint analysis, when you try to uh, model multivariate outcome, one important com component is how to model dependence within the same subject across different uh, outcomes. So the, what we do, probably you can also imagine, we're going to do use random effects to do that. So, so for both the, the type of events, the model, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to use proportion hazard model. So you can see, look at first expression here. So you can easily see this is a proportion hazard model and then you incorporate the covariance here. But also we have this B1, which is random effect shared by this asymptomatic events. So basically explain like, for example, potential frailty or dependence between time to diabetes, time to hypertension. And for uh, asymptomatic events, which is subject to right sensor data, we also use proportion hazard model. But you can see in addition to conversion the regression model, we introduce another running for B2. So B2 is independent of B1. So they try to capture the dependence among this uh, 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 symptomatic events. Like I say, you can imagine is uh, something capture the relationship among these cardiovascular events, like stroke, MI, and the death, right? So, but also we include B1 in the second model. So in other words, B1 basically try to capture the dependence between the first type of group of events and the second group of events, okay? So in other words, using these two learning effects, we can capture all the between events 
dependence with the same subject, but we try to separate the random effects for different type of group of events. So you have B1 for one group, B2 for another group, but between those two groups, you have another B1 uh, dependence through like gamma K. So in some sense, like if a gamma K is zero, so which means that these two groups of type events, they are kind of independent, once conditional covariance, right? So, uh, and basically it's saying like, okay, time to hypertension or like a diabetes has no effect. I mean, for individual, no potential effect on this uh, time to uh, cardiovascular disease. So what we assume uh, manifest to be normally distributed. So, so as I said earlier, like uh, for first group, they are subject to interval sensor data, uh, subject to interval, interval sensor, sensor range. So the data you can really observe is just interval. So I have this L and R to denote the left end point, right end point of interval. So in other words, we have L and R, so you know this event going, uh, uh, happens between L and R. So if L is zero, which means it's happened before R, because L is, right? So this is called the left sensor. If R is infinity, so then basically means we know it's a right sensor data, right? So, so in the sense of basically you have a left sensor, right sensor, and like a pure in the sensor, which is L is different from zero, R is finite. For certain group of events, or it's a subject to right sensor. So this is standard right sensor data notation. You observe minimum between the event time and the sensor time. You observe sensor indicator. Data. So in all, uh, I just put it together. You can see the last line. Basically, just put all the observation together for the same subject or I here. Well, because we do want to do efficient estimation. So uh, this uh, like a uh, little bit different from like a marginal model or this kind of thing. So usually for efficient estimation, you need to write on join the likelihood. So we know like a parametrical model, maximum likelihood estimation is efficient, right? So. So let's see what we try to do here is we just based on model, based on assumptions, we put on all this journal likelihood function. Very complicated, right? But actually, if uh, look at each component, it's not that complicated. Well, remember first we have a random effects. Random effects is something is a missing data, right? You don't observe random effects, it's just from some random variable. So that's the reason you can see there are integration over random effects, like a double integration here, because we have two random effects. The one I had in blue here, you can easily recognize this is basically the contribution of the likelihood from interval sensor data. Because you observe the event happen between L and the K. So the contribution basically, basically is a survival function at L subtract survival function at R, right? So you can see the first expression exponential basically is a survival function at L. The second one is R. So you take a difference, that's the probability of this event happening between L and R. So this comes from in the sensor component. And the next one is obvious, right? So this one is a very common, people already know that, right? This is basically is for right sensor event, that's a likelihood function. That's uh, if you write on standard Cox model, this is let's right sensor likelihood contribution. So I mean, like the experiment looks wrong, but the actual each piece is very simple. The only thing why it's become complicated, obviously, is because we have multiple times. So you have product of a different type of events, and then we have random effects. You have integration over B. All right, so the approach we take is a maximum likelihood estimation. So, um, and actually we are going to do is this, I call the, we call the non-parametric maximum likelihood estimation. Non-parametric maximum likelihood estimation basically is Try to treat the parameter. Remember what are parameters here? So I can, uh, I don't know how to go back. <laughs> I can keep go forward, but let's see. Let's go back. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. So um, in a like function, what are parameters? You know, beta, sigma square, of course, they are parameters. But you see there are two, uh, not two, there are a, a number of this nuisance parameter. I don't say nuisance, but infinite dimensional parameter. This is a baseline function. So basically, is lambda k. We, because Cox model based on function is so to unknown, so they're fully non-parametric, right? So you want to maximize this like function, so you need to deal with this non-parametric function, lambda k, small lambda k, capital lambda k, this is the integral of this small lambda k. So, and the approach we take is a non-parametric MLE. So non-parametric MLE idea is, well, because lambda k essentially tells you when this event is gonna happen, 
And the, like in the usual Cox model for right sensor data, what do we do? We assume lambda k, this capital lambda k to be step function and the only jump at the observed time point. The reason why I only have a jump at the time point is because let's what the data tell you, right? If you don't observe event at this time, there's no point you going to assume lambda going to jump here. So this in this sense is really like a data driven your estimate. The second thing is that we do the kind of number module we are not using smoothing. So this is kind of different from spine. Spine it model this uh, lambda k through like a smooth spine function. But we are not doing all this smoothing. So only thing is this jump size. So basically, you can see this uh, capital lambda k, uh, like uh, this uh, flop bracket and y k is jump size at the observed time point. So basically, the point is like uh, you treat this lambda k as the function, and the observed time points you have a jump. So it's like a piecewise constant function, right? And this jump size going to be used to replace the small lambda k, even though small lambda is a drifted. But we know with respect to dominated measure is a drift too. So, so in, in this case, we replace this by jump size, and then this cumulated capital lambda k basically jump size cumulative summation, right? So with this kind of concept introduced in the like function, so we can rewrite this like function as this one. Again, it's very tedious just because a lot of notations. But the main point here is now parameters because of course still beta sigma square, but in addition to that, we have this jump size. And you know, jump size happen on the observed time points. So for right sensor data, so it just happened at the observed right sensor data, right? For interval sensor data, and the what time points based on those kind of left points, right points of each interval, because every interval endpoint there's a possibility going some event going to happen down there. So, okay. So with that, then you can imagine that the number of parameters is huge. Think about like say, if you have 100 subjects, you have 100 events, then for each type, I write a sensor interval. So I write a sensor event, then you have 100 jump size. For interval sensor, probably you have 100, between 100 and 200, because you don't jump at zero and infinity. So like something between 100 and 200. So in that case, with the 100 sum size, you have almost like a support four type of events, about 400 parameters or more than 400 parameters. And we want to maximize this function over more than 400 parameters. So computation is a very uh, daunting that task. So we have to deal with this issue. So idea we should do with this, we, well, I personally like a EM algorithm because <laughs> EM algorithm tried to avoid all this kind of integration, missing data thing, by through breaking into small optimization problem in the M step. So what are we doing here is, while we use EM algorithm, the first I need to break the integral. Remember I have an integration over random effects. And then you say when you divide the integration or likelihood, you have to do numerical integration, you have to take a log, you have to do a maximization. So EM algorithm, we treat this random effects as missing data. Okay, so basically, you can imagine every subject has two random variables, b1, b2, but we don't observe them, and they follow this normal distribution. So, so you choose on the missing data. So, then if you choose the missing data, then the complete data, which means b1, b2, are, uh, are comp also observed, is given by this one, right? Complete log like function. You don't have integration, right? Because b1, b2 assumed to be observed. So in this case, first, this is the first step. We can get rid of this integration, which usually causes a lot of optimization uh, issue. But second step, we, uh, well, if you look at this one, this is like an M step object function, right? For right sense one, it's easy, right? Because once you treat the B1, B2 as observed, then this is just standard cop, uh, like a partial likelihood you can write out, you can solve for that. So yeah, otherwise, you don't have, uh, you don't need to worry about a second part for right sense. But the still issue is the first term, you can say exponential minus summation minus another exponential summation. This comes from interval sense event. And this function is still really nonlinear. Actually, it's not convex. So, so how to optimize this one? So let's kind of think, uh, yeah, that's why I try to emphasize here, the how to deal with this, uh, this one. Right the sense part is easy. If you maximize all some side, you can get an explicit solution. You get a partial likelihood. 
That's kind of standard way you do Cox model. So to deal with the first part, the, uh, the, uh, the idea we introduced actually is uh, was uh, already uh, given in our like a paper back to 2016. We introduced the kind of post random variable. So we treat it, basically we introduce uh, for each side we treat the post random variable. And uh, for some person, so post random variable have yes, that's a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. What kind of question? Uh, it's not on the chart window, right? Okay. All right, sure. Thank you. All right, so um, so the idea we need to pursue, so you remember this, this uh, jump size can happen at a lot of time points, right? Between each small time interval, we introduce one person random variable. Okay? So, you know, person random variable, we know either zero, one, two, three, so on. If we observe event happen between, say, time L and the time R, okay, then basically that implies the person random variables before this L or this kind of random variable, they are zero. But between this interval, the only some person random variable is uh, not zero, it's a uh, positive. Why this uh, is, uh, it, well, I mean, mathematically you can prove this like we prove it, you know? But in theory, I, actually I told you, she said like, Bayesian people already know that, you know, I just want to, um, we we discovered later, so we're kind of behind. A lot of cases when we teach this Cox proportion or the model, we start counting process, we start has a function, but actually, if you guys, you can do like a little bit of homework exercise. If you assume some Poisson process, and this Poisson process, like a Poisson intensity is this lambda t, you can prove Cox model essentially try to model the first time this Poisson process, or suppose it start from zero, this Poisson process, they're going to be away from zero. So in other words, you can see the Poisson process stochastic process, right? They start from zero. So when they're going to start jump from zero to one or above one, this, if the, the first time they're going to jump from zero to one, if you write on that kind of, uh, it's very easy. If you write on that survive function or this distribution, it's exactly equal to cost model. So in that sense, all we talk about cost model for time to event, essentially is the first time of some person process start from zero. The first time they're going to jump away from zero. Yes. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, so do I mute? I mute. Let's see. Hello, Donny. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can hear you. Yeah. Hi, Donny. First of all, welcome back to Michigan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Donny, actually, uh, for this non-parametric MOE, yes. um, you model the jump size at distinct failure time points, right? Mm -hmm. so, so here, essentially, the number of the parameters increase with the sample size. Yes. Okay, then what, what is your asymptotic framework here? So, yeah, of yeah, course, I, I read your 2007 paper, so I know what's going on, but maybe for the people who are not very familiar with non-parametric MOE, you, you yeah, probably that, that's a good point. Uh, I can either answer now or I can answer when I talk about asymptotics. What do you think? Yeah, whenever, yeah, whenever you want to talk. Okay, maybe uh, I can when I go to asymptotic, I can give a little bit of description out down there. Is sure. that okay? Yeah, All right. Great. All right, Same. thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, um, now it's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so I get back to that. If I forget, remind me. Um, uh, when did I, uh, okay. Yeah, so that's the whole point of this person random variables. So because there's a so natural connection between person process and the Cox model, so you, you can imagine introduce this independent person random variable is a very natural way. The reason we introduce person random variable is that the Poisson process, because remember, 
we make this lambda to be discrete jump. So in other words, we discretize swipe time in the sense. So that's why it becomes discrete sequence of post-learning variable instead of the whole process. But it's still equivalent, right? So once you, once you introduce a post-learning variable, so as I said, you observe with interval sensor L and R, essentially is all the post variable before L is zero, but uh, there's a jump uh, of, basically there's some post variable between L and the R, they are positive, okay? And then you may wonder, okay, this makes it even more complicated, right? Originally only have like one event, now you introduce a sequence of post learning variable. But the big thing, I'm not sure if I have on slide, big thing is, actually in the panel count data, I gonna show you. When you use post learning variable to replace this time to event process, and the way you treat this post learning variable as missing data, right? You, don't, you still don't observe this W. You only observe, like what's that? You only observe before L is zero, between L and R, summation of this person is positive, right? But if you choose a person as a missing data, and then you go to this EM over and you write the M step. And then you can see because the complete data is like a person variable. And the way to person variable is essentially is like person regression. And the person regression is so easy, actually. And actually like you can have expressed expression for this lambda, for this person in, uh, rate. Which I, well, unfortunately, I didn't write it for in the sense of, but when I go to pan account data, you can see this uh, kind of uh, advantage. So the main idea is that after I introduce this person random variables, and I'm gonna uh, treat the both person, and remember, we still have random effects B1, B2, they are all missing data. And then we go do it standard E step, M step. And I guarantee uh, to you, like uh, in the M step, computation is so easy because first, the most headache part is this is the jump size, right? But the, you know, when you go to M star, all this jump size has explicit solution. You can read, this like a Cox model, right? Like write a sensor data, you can write a jump size. Use like a data divided by summation at the risk. And the for the interval sensor, you have explicit expression. So only thing you really need to, uh, once you get a lambda explicit expression, the only thing you need to optimize is just only beta and the sigma square, which is a very finite dimensional parameter. And actually is, uh, is convex in the, in the, in the, in the M step. So computation is almost like a so Cox uh, partial likely function, so, okay. So that's the uh, advantage of this one. So that's why we make this kind of computation kind of stable because a lot of instability from previous algorithm is this very large number of parameters. You put hundreds, hundreds of parameters in the optimization tool, no matter MATLAB, R or Python you're using, they're all gonna have this kind of issue, so. But here, we try to avoid that because more, uh, these hundreds of uh, jump size can be expressed as solved, solved. Yeah, so this is m step optimization we have here. Yeah, actually, I, yeah, I have you. So like uh, you can see, because m step you can replace missed data by this uh, posterior mean or this kind of thing, as you can see from here. But yeah, I just want you, want you to pay attention to those jump size. Again, second part of right sensor that jump size, you don't need to worry, you, you, you know that. The interval sensor data, you can see jump size big, uh, contribution is log lambda minus lambda exponential one. You maximize over lambda, you can write a solution. You can get an express the solution in terms of beta. All right, so this kind of describe okay, how to deal with that. And then we're going to see this kind of algorithm again in the pan account data for a second one. And so we theoretically, we show this uh, uh, MPMI is uh, uh, consistent, a symmetry normal. And the, uh, I'm going to go to uh, E's question later when I talk about panel count, we're going, we're going to show this again. And for variance estimation, so the point is uh, here, we cannot treat all the parameters as same. Remember parameter, we have beta, we have sigma square, we have jump size. But the, for the end of the sensor data, this jump size cannot be estimated same rate as parametric rate because they don't have uh, parametric uh, rate information to estimate. So you cannot treat all the parameters together, try to check the information. So usually people rely on this profile like a function. And the essential idea is you fix the parameter you're interested like a beta sigma square, but you just maximize over this nuisance parameter based on the jump size. And how to do that? You use the EM algorithm again, you do EM, but just only thing is you fix your theta. You don't change your theta. Only thing you change your lambda. And this kind of profile is the calculation is very quick because as I said, during the iteration, this jump size 
it can be computed explicitly. So you don't do, do need, don't need to do any neutron interruption. You don't need to do any optimization. You just iterate express the calculated lambda, and then you get a convergence. So then we use profile algo to estimate covariance. Then because I'm going to repeat this kind of thing in the panel count, so I just put it in one slide. So um, for multivariate universe, uh, the big thing is uh, well, why you want to do joint analysis, right? Because uh, you make things more complicated. But, I'm, but, but you can see the big thing about joint analysis is you can you make use of all, all the information. If you do marginal model, for think about it, you only model like one type of event, forget about the other one. You can, you can only look the population quantity uh, relationship between risk factor and this type of event, right? But the, how you incorporate like some information, say some people already had the hypertension before, how you gonna incorporate the information to help with like prediction or risk assessment in the future? So joint analysis had this kind of advantage, right? Because you know joint distribution. So you can see this kind of example I demonstrated, like suppose you have somebody come in, you know event history at the time t, before time t. So before time t, you can see maybe this person had a certain like a diabetes or uh, hypertension before time t, or maybe this person had like a stroke before time t. Okay, now how are you going to predict the mortality after t, you know, right? Or like a risk score, like suppose you want to give every, every patient different risk assessment. Do you want to move risk higher or lower? You know, this kind of question is very natural, like in dynamic risk prediction and uh, all, all these kind of uh, uh, time-sensitive treatment as well. So in this case, if we try to predict survival, we try to discriminate between survival function and cumulative incidence function. Uh, the reason is, uh, is uh, when you have this uh, time to death, you know, death is a competing risk type thing, right? So in that case, it, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, to talk about, uh, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, here you survive function or something. So because at the time T, they already survive. There's no point that you say why survive. So, uh, okay, so this is a kind of formula like you can use for prediction. And the main thing is like at the time T, because you already observe each history, so you conditional history. So uh, you can update this random effects based on posterior distribution given history, because you, you build green information, try to update what's this uh, B. And then incorporate this B into this uh, joint distribution. The reason we can write joint distribution because we're joint model, right? We can write a joint density, joint distribution. And then from there, we can get a future prediction. So I don't have to do this. It's just a simple exercise how to put a joint distribution into future prediction. And then the other thing is uh, we can also do like a risk score, uh, like a, a assessment. Like for example, if you don't have random effects, risk goes to semi beta X, right? Let's call model. But we have random effects, so you can see there are two components, B1, B2 here. But because we already know history, we observe events happen before time T, uh, I, I think it's S, before time S, then basically we can use the information to update your B1, B2. Because B1, B2 essentially is like this individual hidden fairity in this person high risk group or low risk group, right? But because you already observe the history, you can use the information and try to re-update your B1, B2. So in this case, we replace B1, B2 by this posterior mean. So in that case, we incorporate the history information, try to adjust the risk risk for this person over time here. So, uh, and then the, the last one is also, uh, yeah, basically it's a posterior mean to do that, so. All right, so I hope this uh, make clear to you about this multiple type. But next time I go move to Pelican data. Pelican data turns out is a little bit more uh, less simple. So the Pelican data, if you look at the K type of recurrent events, as I said earlier, Pelican is you don't observe event happen, when they happen, but instead you observe number of events happen from uh, between time one, time two, time two, time three. So the, what you observe is a count. So, and again, we assume this uh, like, like Cox model, but it says, uh, if X is a time independent, is a time independent, then they call the proportion intensity model. But it's a kind of parallel of the proportion hard model of, of to recurrent events. Okay, so we can, we still introduce random effects as you can see here. So first the BKI is a random effects for the same type of recurrent events. 
right? Because that's the same type of it happen multiple times. So there's one random effects try to capture this kind of relationship. And then there's a, uh, this Kasai, this is a common random effect shot between different type of events. So you can see there are two set of random effects. One is type specific random effect, BKI. The other one is subject specific effect, random effect shot by different types of events. And uh, okay, so this is the kind of model. And the, as I said, data you observe, you don't observe whole counting process. Instead, you just observe count between time UK, uh, UJ and UJ minus one, how many events happen between those two time points. Again, you write a micro function, but this case is actually, it's uh, simpler compared to previous case because when you observe time count, then you write a micro function, like in the, in, inside this, you can easily recognize, basically is a person, person distribution, the count is person distributed, right? So you can write that one. And it's the same thing we use MPMLE. So we're going to put jump size on this observed time points. And then we try to replace this lambda by this jump size lambda, small lambda, and then we try to maximize it. And then the way idea is we should be running fast as missing data. And then we treat the, we also create this Poisson W, I'm probably I have here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we also treat uh, this, uh, uh, introduce the Poisson running variable. So basically, it's a person, right? Every small interval has a person random variable. The way you observe like count between these two time points, basically, is what you observe is a summation of those person variable, right? So in other words, completely is a, is a sequence of person random variable, but the data you observe is summation of person in this interval, summation of person in this interval, and so on. So you can, so if you think of it this way, then you treat a W as missing data, then you can use EM algorithm. And uh, if you write on EM algorithm, E star, M star, as uh, usually do. And then the main thing I want to tell you is actually this same thing you know, in the previous interval sensor data. In the M star, the jump size can be expressed as so, uh, given by this one, which is nice, right? Because you don't have to do any like a nonlinear, like a, a black box optimization to solve for lambda, because lambda. Let, let's say parameter cause a lot of trouble. Has expressed the expression in terms of beta. So there's a beta here. And then you plug in this lambda into original M step and the beta is a convex function. This is very similar like a partial likelihood actually. And then you can solve for beta very easily. Okay. So this is a kind of big advantage you use this kind of personalization uh, uh, for this time to event. And then this is, uh, works very well for a lot of universe sensor data. And I think after we developed this algorithm, we uh, try to uh, do a lot of experiments, right? We did all different initial value and find the algorithm conversion very well and very stable. And actually more recently, we also find that if you choose uh, for interval sensor data, if you choose uh, a temporal estimate as initial value, and then you can speed out the computation. Uh, well, probably, you know, EM algorithm, it will work stably, but the disadvantage is slow because it's a linear convergence rate, so we know that. But you can use some way to try to speed up. So choose a good initial value, or some people use a third EM, basically a delayed replaced by Newton Robson. We didn't implement it here. Uh, it works very well for our data size, uh, like a hundred data size. All right, so this is asymptotics. So this can relate to uh, each question. So um, when we try to prove asymptotic for parameter, remember parameter, we have this parameter, not finite dimension parameter, beta, sigma square, right? But also we have this uh, uh, baseline function. When we try to pull a symmetry, we deal with this cumulative one. So this is capital is a cumulative. So it's a cumulative summation of jump size. So each jump size convergence rate is, I even don't know, maybe one of, uh, it's very slow. There's no way you can make an inference for jump size because this uh, uh, jump size, this jump size first increase with the sum size and also change from data to data. Right, so because for this data, the events is one, uh, happen time points is one, two, the jump is one, two, but the other data maybe is three, four, then jump size is three, four. So there's no way you can do inference for jump size. But instead, we try to do a symmetric for cumulative one, because essentially you can look at the after two T, what's a cumulative hazard function, cumulative baseline function. And the, uh, so, so this uh, is a function parameter like lambda KT. 
And the nice thing working on this cumulative one is, uh, is a more tone. It's an increasing, non-decreasing function. So uh, with the non-decreasing uh, function, there's a lot of nice property. So if you study empirical process, people like this because it's a Donska class or something like that. So, so this is kind of a parameter we look into. We use the gem size in the computation, but the parameter we focus on is this cumulative hazard function. I'm not sure if you answer question. Hope he's still there. Yes, indeed. Oh, okay. So actually, I think this is very interesting. Uh, I have an interesting analog. So Donlin, so I, I'm I, I'm sure you are also familiar with this so-called Nelson Allen estimator, right? Nelson Allen estimator is just the uh, the summation of the uh, estimated hazard up to a particular time point. But mm -hmm. you never try to prove, you know, the asymptotic for each hazard estimate. But instead, you only focus on the cumulative hazard function. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's uh, it's essentially the cumulative like a rate of survival function. So uh, and also like uh, I mean a lot of symmetry stuff for right uh, in, uh, for universal sensor right sensor data is a focus on this cumulative one, especially for right sensor data when you deal with the cumulative one you get a similar parametric convergence rate as a beta you know beta estimate, yeah. So for this uh, hazard rate function, as I said, because it happens at different time points from data data. So if you're interested in hazard rate function, you have to do kind of smoothing. Like kernel smoothing or type of smoothing, try to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, I'm not going to show this detail, and but I talked to somebody about usually this presentation. You need to add to this slide to show oh, how elegant the math is, <laughs> but you, you can discard it. Yeah. If you're interested, you can look at our paper, and uh, we have all the detail about the proof. Um, Okay, what well, I was uh, estimating is still based on profile. So, uh, so this is kind of the uh, same way as what we did before. All right, so I just moved to simulation study. So the first type of simulation is the focus on this multiple interval sensor data. So we generate the covariance like this, and then we create uh, uh, two interval sensor type of events, uh, three right sensor events, and last, among these three, one is a terminal event, basically like a time to death. So we try to mimic this Eric example, like say, you can imagine two, like a ton to diabetes, ton to hypertension, they are subject to interval sensory. And the three, like a ton to MI, ton to the stroke, and ton to death. You can, and then we use uh, this uh, baseline function and we generate uh, 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 this uh, examination time we generate from this sequence. So, right, so, so basically like uh, this mimic uh, like uh, monitoring time and the based on monitoring time, we should determine this event occurred within the interval or not. If it's uh, within this interval, let's L and U, we're gonna use, right? Okay, so uh, this uh, just quickly show you simulation results. Well, obviously results should be good. <laughs> Otherwise I won't show you. Um, and the best more coverage is pretty good. There's a little bit like of catch for various component. And the, we saw this uh, many times, we deal with the various components. And there are some uh, work to try to deal with this, but we simply, we just uh, take a log transformation, try to make this look better, but still like a 97. Um, and the convergence, I think uh, for this case, convergence is almost every single simulation converge. There's no non convergence issue. For some size 100, maybe like 0.5% uh, times, there's a little bit of non convergence issue, but 200 and above, I think it's fine. And then usually like for each data, the number of iteration took in the EM over is about like 300, 400 iterations. Some that can be larger, some that can be smaller, depending on what kind of data you have, but it's reasonable. So, um, and this shows like this cumulative uh, baseline function estimator. So you can see dash is estimated one, the solid is tr uh, truth. So you can see average is very close. But then what I really want to show you is like kind of Prediction, right? Because we do join the analysis, we really want to predict, right? Otherwise, why you want to do join us? If you only want to know which risk factor associated with uh, uh, one per event, you can do marginal model. You don't have to do this join one. So this is just one example trying to show for prediction. Say like even the two occurred between zero and one. Oh, let, we try to make a prediction at the time one. So there's one event before one. Uh, there's a event one, three, four, five, uh, three, four, five had not happened. So you can see this uh, basically, if you look at the notation here, that's just kind of information from event history. So we incorporate this into our prediction model. And this just is trying to show you 
uh, when you try to predict accumulated instance function uh, for event one, event three, let's kind of curve you have. And you can see empirically, our estimate is very close to the truth. The, the solid one is the truth, so. Uh, I think I have another, but probably not here. Oh, oh yeah, probably in the real data, sorry. And for panel count, we do the same thing. In this case, it just generated recurrent events instead of general time to events. And uh, I don't have to repeat the scenario I described here, but just mainly just show you the, uh, the results are pretty good. And also we compare the separate analysis. You can see some efficiency gain when you try to do multivariate version versus univariate panel count data analysis. So I don't have to spend too much here. Oh, this is a little bit complicated detail about panel count data. So I think we see a convergence there's so like a 10 to minus three. So basically it's uh, the parameter, the difference, the, I think it's a summation of the difference between all the parameters is, is below 10 to minus three, we start. And the maximum number iteration in is uh, set to be 1000 and the EM usually converge 99.8% for sample size 200 and the everything converge for 400 to 800. And uh, the, the second one shows like a uh, uh, computation time. Um, it seems to be a bit of, uh, okay, but when you do one single data, it's a doable. It's a 30 seconds and mostly 500 seconds for one data. But as I said, uh, you can do a little bit more work. Like for example, you can use the tempo estimator as the initial value. And the recently we found the can speed out the computation and the results are very, very similar. So we haven't implemented it here uh, in this work yet. Uh, this is just like a uh, estimator for baseline function. Okay, now let's move to a real application. The first application, as I mentioned, is Eric's study. And this uh, original data size is uh, 16,000 participants. And that's a study from 1899. There are five visit observatories. It's still ongoing. You know? Actually, it's a very long study. And they done in four counties in this country. And uh, we uh, look, uh, look at the events. So we uh, screw the people who already have uh, event condition, like a diabetes, hypertension at the baseline, because we want to look at the time to diabetes, time to intervention after baseline. So we screw them, and we screw the missing data, end up like 8,000, um, almost 9,000 subjects. And then this summarizes the information we have among this cohort. Okay, this table basically show you the estimate for those various components. Remember, I have this gamma in this multiple model, and I hope you remember that. Basically, let's kind of describe, the, uh, describe how, how large dependence between these two types of uh, events, right? One is interval sensor type of the other, right sensor data. So this shows gamma is a significant, which means there is very strong dependence between those two, right? So, um, and this just shows like different risk factors for each outcome. I had the blue, I, the one I had in blue is, uh, is a significant one. So you can see uh, some biomark, this is based on biomark. So like BMI, glucose, systolic uh, blood pressure, smoke status, they are highly uh, predictive or highly associated with the type of diabetes, hypertension, and they're also associated with the MI stroke and so on. So, um, but there are some is not significant one type. So, uh, because there's so much information here. So I do not want to go into that. All right, so this is kind of thing I want to tell you, like, uh, remember when I described joint model, I also mentioned this kind of risk, risk assessment, right? Each time point, you can use joint model update the risk score and then use the risk score to try to assess that these people is a high risk, low risk at this time point, right? And that's what we did. We use this kind of project compared to if you don't use this drone model, you just only use the baseline variable, try to come out risk score and try to see how it works. And uh, uh, this basis is like C index, you know, like suppose you have a cross validation version, use the uh, testing data, and then we use uh, baseline risk score, use our dynamic risk score, and try to say, if I want to predict a uh, uh, event yeah, in the testing data, which one is more accurate? And then usually people use C, C index for sensor data. So that's what we do here. And the red one associated with our dynamic risk score, this uh, uh, black one is uh, baseline. So you can see overall, this uh, use the incorporate history information based on this joint model to give you a higher in-depth compared to only use baseline. In some sense, this is intuitive, but, uh, well, but on the other hand, without this joint model, the, how you come up with this dynamic risk score. So you can, I hope you can appreciate this uh, joint model type of uh, advantage. All right, so this, uh, we also have this kind of like a kind of simple app, try to say, okay, if you get information in, 
how we going to app uh, patients risk profile. Like you can see this example, start baseline risk profile like this. And at the year three, this person has hypertension, diabetes, and the risk for it going to change and so on. So we have this kind of simple app. You can see how risk are going to change. Actually, this cumulative instance. So you basically, you can see risk too. Okay, for pen account data, the example we see this is a skin cancer trial. And this is a clinical trial of about like 540 patients on each arm. And we want to see if this drug is effective or not. And there are two types of skin cancer. One, uh, I think I described here, one is the basal cell carcinoma, and the other is a squamous cell carcinoma. So, so we looked at these two different types of cancer cell, and the data I give it to you is count data. It's on monitoring time. You could see how many tumor cells in the, for this patient. So, right, and this, how many tumors in this patient. So, uh, so this just gives you information for this type of data. Actually, data is public and available. You can download, I think, from some package. And then we put that here. So what do we do is, well, the first two is this multivariate. In this case, it's only two, right? Two type of uh, uh, panel count data. So you can see the results from this, uh, for each type of recurring variable. And the last one is we ignore the type. We just put and treat it as the same type of uh, recurring events and try to say it make a difference or not. So you can see it does make a difference for some effect like a direction, like age bigger than 65, they got to a different. But if you look at the treatment, which is this is randomized trial, if you look at the treatment effect, you can see the treatment is a uh, sign is kind of consistent between each type, but for overall, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of in a bit it's smaller, the size. But now then it's a significant. So in other words, basically from this analysis, we didn't really see treatment effect for each type of skin cell. Actually, with this uh, in the one paper for this real study actually reports, uh, uh, reports some significant treatment effect on basal cell carcinoma. But we have to look into their analysis to see if it really, I, I, I believe they don't use pen account to do that. So probably just based on person model or something. Um, and then this is just a prediction based on model. Anyway, so uh, I'm deeply over time, but this is just by last slide. So conclusion remark basically is we provide this very general framework when you have a, a time to events uh, from different types and subject to different sensory mechanism, right? It can be recurrent events and how we're going to build this general framework. And particularly we introduce method with statistically most efficient and the computationally we can deal with that. And also we show this journal model can be very useful for future prediction and especially like when you uh, people do this kind of uh, mobile health or dynamic prediction, use EHR or whatever, I think this can be incorporated. And actually we have a package for the first topic for multiple pen account, we don't have package. Uh, so the first part is in uh, my colleague Dan Yilin's uh, website. If you are interested, you can download from there. So um, I think uh, that's all. Thank you all for listening. So. Yes, then. Uh, which one? Uh, for for which uh, for pen account or for the oh, first one? Okay, yeah, sure. Is it very early, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, right here. Okay, sounds like gift box. So yeah, and, okay. So I think a guess question is why we set this learning for specifically B1 shared by first type of group or events. Well, I think this is a good question. So I think for this type model, the main motivation is we think interval sensitive events is a very different, capture patients' health status or morbidity or different from the other one. And the particular is in the Eric study, you can see the universe thing was a type of diabetes, type of hypertension, right? So let's kind of relate to this, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain it biologically, but
But the other one is really like cardiovascular type of events. So we, so in this sense, B1, we think these two type of group of events are very different. So B1 can recapture what's going on. What's going on for the, the first group it can the second group. But if you want to make a journal, you can come up with different uh, correlation structure. So, um, so I think let's kind of, so obviously you don't want to uh, cap, uh, have like a very saturated random effect which uh, you can identify. So for example, like I think uh, when we submit this paper, that one, one question is like, suppose you have this uh, only one single time to event in the second group, you cannot estimate B2 because B2, you have to use border information from two different type of events to do that. So if you only have one single time to event in the second group, you have to job B2, you can only keep a gamma KB1, B1, right? But you could be like, say, if you have some other knowledge, like I say, the first group of type of events, they can still have this kind of subclass. You maybe you want to introduce a different random effect structure for subclass and between subclasses. I think this is mainly modeled by our Eric, uh, this example here. Yeah. But let's get point for. Thank you. Sure. Any questions that people on the Zoom? Uh, what about the oh, oh, yeah. So I need to unmute. Hi, yeah. I was wondering if there were applications beyond a clinical setting. Like a lot of the times, if like thinking about mental health, like risk factors there sometimes aren't always seen, or if we have patients that are going a long ways in between seeing um, mental health care providers, if there are applications beyond things like heart attacks. So if I try to understand your question, because there's a little bit of echo, I can freak out. So you're talking about how we deal with a certain in mental health, when people go to different healthcare or or just applications outside of necessarily like a clinical setting um, with like hospitals and time interval patients. Oh, I don't yeah. know if that question makes sense. So, um, well, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that this should be applied to any type of setting, like when you have visits, not necessarily clinical setting. So uh, probably like, a, I, I'm not sure if you, what do you describe like a happy, like a HR data, right? People capture not a clinical, tend to hospital, tend to, uh, right? So it, 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 is, is what you ask for? Maybe I still. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, you mean in COVID interval event as 10 covers? Right. So you almost start about predicting like, let's say, death. How do you do using the joint method versus just having a time variable? Well, uh, I, we didn't do a comparison here, but uh, let me try to see there's some potential issue to do that. Well, because the interval can be very wide, right? So suppose I want to prediction at time t, but in the one maybe r go beyond the t, right? In the second one, you what you have is you know when they happen in the one, but when they happen, you don't know, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty here. So in that case, if you try to incorporate information, I think that first question, how to incorporate, right? And the, what, uh, it, what you should incorporate to really meaningful, that's, that's kind of the issue, so. Yeah, but, but you could do that. So, I mean, like if the interval is very narrow, maybe you can cover the information as time dependent coverage to improve that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, like, intuitively, I would assume that this gets you more power, but it would be interesting to see with that Eric example. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think I, I agree, like what we should compare, we try to compare the worst scenario. People only use baseline information. Yeah, but uh, if you really want to compare, like use time dependent certain information, I think uh, we need to identify what, how people incorporate it and then we can use it as a comparison. Yeah, that's it.
So talk about this pattern count data, right? Um, I don't remember data has a death issue. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't remember we have this uh, near death information, this data. It's a public available data. I can go back to check. But yeah, but if there is, then we're going to incorporate as a competing risk into this joint model framework. Yeah. Any more questions from people here? So, Dongling, can, can I ask you another question? Yes, yes, please. Hi, Dongling. So, um, can you go back to the slides where you show B1 and B2? Okay, so and then oh. you go back again. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, right here. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so just consider the extreme cases, you know, where the sigma one and the sigma two are zero, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in this setting, basically, th this is equi equivalent to analyzing different uh, diseases separately, right? Okay. And then you showed that uh, you gain efficiency basically because the, the diseases, different diseases are correlated. And then you have this uh, normal distribution or something here. So my question here is, what happens if you misspecify the distribution of this normal distribution? Oh, does well, it matter? That's good for probably you are our reviewer. <laughs> no, 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 run the effect distribution. And our general message is um, the impact for uh, prediction is very small. You know, because we understand that, but if you predict survival, seriously, if you use Cox model, proportional Oz model, it will give a very similar survival prediction. So, but the, for beta, there's some impact. Of course, it depends on how different the misspecification is. Yeah, so there are some, well, I don't remember, there are some, well, People did try to do use the data, try to test the, this normality assumption. I don't remember to do that. Um, but, but again, like a, the reason we use a normal is the gamma is uh, there are two type of reason is while we, in the mixed effect more people like to use normal, right? That's very natural to understand. And the second one, like uh, in the second model, uh, if you look at the, this model is a little bit specific, but if you look at the panel count data, you can see if as a normal, I can allow interaction between covers and the running effects. But if you do gamma or log gamma, I don't think it looks very natural to introduce this kind of thing like a, a, like a random slope or use a log gamma. You know? So that's kind of normal normality. We think it can be more practical, accessible by people you to use. Do you answer your question? E? Yes, thank you. But, uh... Can you just actually send me the paper? I really want to see oh, this. Paper. Sure, sure. I can send uh, both papers. There are two papers. One is uh, uh, motivated, the other is pack. I send to you. Okay, now then I can begin my review. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any more questions from audience here? Oh, yeah, you have a question. Sorry. K, K2, yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe I confuse you. So K is number of events. The person running variable is a, is a sequence running variable for each K. So for each event time, there's a sequence of person. That's evil. So, so, so basically for each event, like I say, time, time to diabetes, I can treat it as some person variable accumulate, start from zero. And then whenever this person accumulated this uh, 
times 10, like above zero, and this is when diabetes happens. So, uh, it's what well, each, yeah, each interval, yeah, there's a person, but for each type of event, there's a, this uh, person, right? So each event. There's some person is uh, like, because like if you observe interval is L and R, right? But there in the, this big interval, there's a lot of small interval. Each small interval has a person. When I say summation of a person, it's a sum of this person within this interval, yeah. Well, I can talk to you more about this. Yeah, maybe I'll just, yeah. I, I just, I, uh, because this is more specific, is it okay? I, maybe I'll talk after this. Yeah. Any more questions? Maybe take a follow-up, no? All right. Yeah. All right, thank you all. So. Sharing and you know, on Trevor, there's a question I asked, right? Oh, uh, yeah, you got oh, that. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a All good right. day. Okay, Bye. thank you.